Clear Lake City, Texas. In May 2003, Tiffany Rowell and Rachel Colarutis, among many other people, proudly graduated from their high school. They were entering the next stage of their lives and had many summer plans with friends and family. Tiffany was off to become a social worker and Rachel was thinking of joining the military. Tiffany's boyfriend of three years, Marcus, also had a place at college and his cousin Adelbert, who had recently moved to Clear Lake for a fresh start, had big plans too. After Tiffany's mother had died, her father remarried and moved out of the area. Tiffany stayed in the house so she didn't have to change schools, so close to graduation. The next month and a half involved a lot of parties at Tiffany's, holding down jobs, saving up for college, and spending as much of the summer together as possible, before they all went their separate ways for a while. Late afternoon, July 18th, 2003. Police received a call from two neighbours who had gone to visit Tiffany. They had walked into her house and found a traumatising scene, one that no one could have predicted. It's an emergency. I got a call from four people dead. Four victims have been shot. Four people lay dead. The floor and walls were covered in blood, and it was obvious that they had all been deceased for several hours already. It was a shocking sight for even the most tenured of police officers. The victims were 18-year-olds Tiffany Rowell and Rachel Colarutis, Tiffany's boyfriend, 19-year-old Marcus Priscilla, and Marcus's cousin, 21-year-old Adelbert Sanchez. Tiffany, Marcus and Adelbert had all been shot to death. And although Rachel had been shot multiple times, she had died of blunt force trauma to her head, and her skull was completely shattered. There was no forced entry. The TV was still blaring. And the way the group had been found indicated it was a total ambush that had happened in a mere matter of seconds. Rachel was found on the floor, with her hand near her phone. She had managed to hit the 9 and 1 buttons to try and call for help, but before any call could go through, she was hit over the head, likely with a gun, and died. There was a clump of hair in her right hand, and she had been shot at least 12 times. Tiffany and Adelbert were on the recliners, their legs stretched out while they had been relaxing watching television and Marcus was found behind the seats on the floor. Over 40 bullets had been fired in the house, and there was a mixture of two different shell casings. No guns were found at the scene, but police could tell that one was a 9mm and one was a 38 caliber so investigators felt confident they were looking for at least two people involved, maybe even more. As the media got hold of the story and news began to spread, Rachel's father George recognised the address on television and headed straight over with his wife. The cameras picked up the heartbreaking moment. He pleaded with the police to let him in, but as it was now a crime scene, it was simply not allowed. They both collapsed to the ground, waiting for someone to tell them something, but knowing deep down, they wouldn't see their daughter alive again. It was disturbing and shocking that something like this could happen in broad daylight, in a neighbourhood where very little went on. Former classmates of Tiffany said that her home had quickly become known as a party house, with drinking and drugs, and often lots of people coming in and out, especially now that it was summer break. So they wondered if maybe an alcohol or drug fueled party had become really out of control. 
that's not what this particular day had been. The four were the closest of friends, and for all intents and purposes, it had just been a very casual afternoon for them, watching television and eating food. Friends, students and neighbours gathered together for vigils, and a sense of unease hovered over everyone. Eighteen-year-old Tiffany always had the biggest smile on her face. As well as wanting to go into social work, she was a talented actress and loved any chance to perform. Rachel Colarutis also loved the arts and creative writing and was very popular in school due to her kind nature. People said that she too was always smiling, happy and fun to be around. Marcus's stepfather said Marcus loved nothing more than working on his car and spending time with his family and Tiffany. He had been finishing a course for an automotive technology certificate and wanted to pursue a business degree. His cousin Adelbert had moved to Clear Lake to get away from violence on the north side and had only been there for a couple of weeks before he was killed. He loved making music and planned to go to college to study computer technology. People could not believe that something this brutal could happen to them and this seemingly random crime had rattled the community. Sadly, there really were no witnesses. No one had heard any gunshots. The houses were very separated, and police said lots of people had their air conditioning and fans on, which could have blocked out the noise. But a couple living nearby had seen something they thought might be relevant. They had seen a very young man and a woman walking down the street at about 2.30pm that day, and to the best of their knowledge, they hadn't seen them before. They were dressed all in black. The woman was wearing a bandana, carrying a big, black bag, and the neighbours described her as very pretty, with big eyes. The witnesses gave the best description they could to the renowned forensic artist, Lois Gibson, who worked with what they could remember, putting together a potential profile but whether these people were in any way linked was really unclear. Just two hours later, Lois had completed the sketches. George, Rachel's father, started working non-stop to try and raise money so they could afford to put the sketches out on billboards and spent most of his time going door to door handing out flyers. Early on, rumours began to swirl that Marcus had been involved in dealing drugs, and maybe this was behind the ambush. It was also alleged that Marcus's family had connections to the Mexican Mafia, and perhaps the other three had been collateral damage to a completely unrelated thing. A close friend of Tiffany's said, I know Marcus was messed up with some bad people, but Marcus's aunt said, he struggled, but he succeeded. No matter how hard he was trying, he was doing the best to do good. One detective said, they were all very young, very immature, and on their own for the first time. The four may have exercised bad judgment at times, but certainly didn't deserve what happened to them. Officers simply couldn't find anything to solidify the claims about the Mafia, and this theory was eventually ruled out. Police did wonder, however, if drugs were involved somehow, but they just didn't have anything yet that pointed to that, as both drugs and cash were found at the scene in plain view. So why hadn't they been stolen? The attack had been so ruthless and felt so personal, Police then started to wonder if it was someone close to the group. Amongst her multiple shots, Rachel had been shot in the crotch area, and psychiatrists wondered if this was a sign of sexual envy or jealousy. But they were ruling people out at a rapid speed, rather than adding any suspects to the list. There was simply no one they could link to the group that would have any motive to do this. Time was slowly ticking by and investigators had no more than they did when they first started. As the weeks turned into months, 
The months soon turned into years. Their confidence in catching whoever was responsible was dwindling. Fast forward to the summer of 2006, almost three years to the day after the shootings. After following leads that went nowhere and interviewing hundreds of people, police finally had a breakthrough. An anonymous tip came in via Crime Stoppers. The person on the end of the phone said they had seen the billboard and gave the police two names. The first was Christine Payalilla, and the second was Chris. The tipster had met Christine in rehab as she was battling a heroin addiction. She had recently split from this mystery man called Chris and was seemingly trying to turn her life around. While in rehab, she made a comment about her ex-boyfriend shooting up a house and killing a group of people, and she had also participated. He didn't know if the story was true or if it was the drugs talking, but after seeing the billboard for himself, he decided to call in. A look into the name Christine Payalilla told the police a lot. It turned out that Christine had gone to Clear Lake High School alongside Tiffany and Rachel, and the connections started to be made. Those in Christine's life said that she had had a tough time in school and was subjected to relentless bullying and attacks from classmates. Her mother and stepfather said that she had been diagnosed with alopecia when she was very young and began wearing wigs, which were frequently ripped off her head by other students. Her mom, Laurie, said... She had poor vision, so she had what I guess most folks would know as Coke bottle glasses. This, as well as her wearing wigs, meant she faced ridicule on a daily basis. Her mother said that one day Christine came home from school and said, Mom, I made two new friends who are the sweetest girls I ever met, Rachel and Tiffany. None other than Rachel Colarutis and Tiffany Rowell. People said that the two almost took Christine under their wings, forming a genuine and tight friendship. Rachel and Tiffany started looking out for her, trying their best to protect her from the bullying. Christine's mom said she couldn't speak highly enough about them, how much fun they were, how loving they were, how they had so much fun. Every minute they spent together was lively and fun, and they laughed all the time, and I saw such a change in her personality. Rachel's father also knew of Christine and said... Rachel was the kind of person that always looked out for the underdog, always tried to help others. Rachel even kept a photo of Christine in her purse. On the back of the picture, Christine had written, Damn, we've had some crazy memories. I love you. The three teens would often write notes back and forth to each other in class, and Laurie recalled that Christine trusted them both so much, she felt okay without the wig on, which is not something she did with many of her friends. The trio would spend hours after school doing each other's makeup and trying on different wigs, having fun, but also making Christine feel comfortable and confident. The girls pushed Christine to try new things and find her creativity, and with this, Christine's confidence began to grow, and she was really coming into her own. She got a huge boost when she was voted Miss Irresistible by the student body at Clear Lake High School. She finally felt like she was leaving her past behind. Christine soon met Chris Snyder. He was two years older than her, and the pair struck up a friendship. Laurie said she immediately disproved of this, but said her daughter wouldn't hear anything bad said about him. Chris ended up serving time for armed robbery, and when he got out, he went straight back to Christine, who was now 16 years old. Christine said that she felt bad, because nobody wanted to be associated with him, and, knowing how this felt, she stuck by him. They soon became romantically involved, and Christine had become more and more distant from her family. Laurie said Christine clung on to him for reasons she didn't understand, despite him often joining in with the bullying. Chris was using a lot of drugs at the time, and before long, so was Christine. Her parents spoke to lawyers and the police, even trying to get a restraining order against him, but Christine was now almost 18 years old, and was making her own decisions. Her stepfather said she felt she was going to be able to fix him, no matter what he did. But others said that the toxicity came from both of them, with people often seeing Christine hitting him and shouting and fighting in public. 
Although this relationship was already on a downward spiral, two people that seemed to be constantly positive and have good energy in her life were Rachel and Tiffany, who stayed just as close to her throughout her relationship with Chris. On the day the group were found dead, Laurie said Christine had come home in floods of tears, crying through most of the night. She said she was so upset, she couldn't attend their funerals. So, with the police knowing all of this, it begged the question, why would someone that was so close to the victims do something like that? How could Christine possibly have been involved? The only person that could answer that question was her, and officers started searching for Christine Payalilla and Chris Snyder. The hunt for Chris proved harder as he was not living at his last known address. But, thanks to ATM and bank records, Christine and her husband Justin were located. They were hauled up in a San Antonio motel, having lived there for almost a year. When officers announced themselves and entered, they walked into what they described as one of the most disgusting things they had ever seen. Used needles, rubbish, food, vomit and drugs littered the floor. Blood and bodily fluids covered the walls and furniture. They said the smell was unlike anything and the state of Christine and Justin was quite shocking. Wearing blood-stained clothes and covered in track marks, just before noon on July 19, 2006, Christine Payalilla was placed under arrest. Police said it was clear that the pair were so deeply in their addictions, it was likely a matter of time before they died. For the last nine months they had been living in the same room, spending every bit of Christine's inheritance money on drugs. Christine told police she was living off of crackers and spending around $500 a day on heroin, but this amount sometimes reached over $1,000. Justin said Christine hadn't left the room once. Christine's police interview began just before 3pm and over the next few hours, the detective begged her to tell the truth. I'd like to be able to understand why, okay? And, ha and why would be helpful if you would give us some insight to what's going on. She admitted to driving Chris to the home that day, but said the murders were all his idea. The plan was to buy drugs from someone inside. Christine said she waited outside in the car before they both drove away. Take me over to um, your homegirl's house or whatever, and I'm going to see if... Uh, if Marcus is there. Okay. He, he got in my car and I, I had I drove off. Okay. And like I saw him like like walking in the opposite direction of their house. And he was like, just drive, just drive. And he pulled out like a, a bag of drugs mm -hmm. from his pocket. Mm-hmm. I was just like, you know, like, damn, you know, I thought, like, he hooked him up, like, you know, like, pretty good. But then I was like, wait, I was like, you know, where, like, you know, he, I knew he didn't have enough money mm -hmm. for what was there. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, he was just like, you know, you know, I, 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 I jacked that fool, I jacked that fool. I started, like, like, freaking out. I was, because... You know, they knew me. The girls, they were my, my good friends. And and I, I just, I couldn't believe, like, you know. That he you jacked them. That he jacked them. Like, that's what I, I knew at that point. Mm -hmm. But when Chris said he had forgot something, the pair went back. She initially said that again, she stayed outside, hearing no gunshots and seeing nothing wrong. She said she only realised something had happened when he came out holding a gun. You gotta go back. You gotta, we gotta, or we gotta go back. It's like I just forgot something, I just forgot something. And, and I was thinking, why would you want to go back when you just jacked these people? Mm -hmm. When you just, like, you know, stole from them. And I started to, like, go down their road. 
And then he he ran he ran into the house. Mar the house meaning Tiffany and Marcus's house. Uh huh. He came running out with the with the gun one of the guns in his hand. I didn't hear any gunshots or anything. Okay. After this happened, they drove off and she clocked in to start her shift at Walgreens just 30 minutes later. I was like, I, I finally said, you know, I, I need to go to work. What did he say, that Christine? He shot them. That he shot them? I'd be freaking out and he would have told you what went on. What did he say? What do you mean he shot them? But the police weren't convinced that this was down to just Chris. Neither were the experts that had analysed the crime scene. They were still standing by their theory that this was a jealous rage or something to do with sexual envy on Christine's part. Although Rachel and Tiffany had befriended Christine, it was still entirely possible that maybe she didn't believe they were being genuine and wanted to punish them. Or her anger at being treated so badly in school had poured over and she had taken it out on them. Now, whether you do it on your own, okay, or whether he forces you, you're in that house because do you love your husband? I know I wasn't in the house. Listen to me. Do you love your husband? I love him very much. You love him very much, yes. okay. Your husband gives exact details of what happens, okay, of exact details. You, in another conversation, okay, give exact details to the person of a distinct event that takes place when the shot is fired. That one of them doesn't even, the quote is, one of them didn't even move off the couch. You know specific details of what happened. Either he pours his heart out to you, all right, when you're leaving there, or you're there. Officers were trying to get as much information out of her as they could, but as the interview drew to a close, Christine started to grow weaker and more sick. She was transported to Santa Rosa Hospital, where she informed doctors that she was used to taking heroin every 10 to 15 minutes, and that she hadn't had any since that morning. After she had been given methadone and morphine, they carried on the interviews inside the hospital, but Christine was still pointing the finger at Chris. She was then put on a plane and flown out to Houston before being placed in a jail cell. A final videotaped interview commenced just before midnight. Her story had now changed. So the gun was in your hand and what was he telling you? One, two, three? He was, he was holding on to it too. Okay, like on top of your hand or something? Yes, like... Yeah, like I, I, I couldn't tell you how it was, like, but that one, that, that, um, like, I was scared and I was, like, crimping, and then I, uh, I had made the, the gun go off, not, not purposely, though, but, like, it, it went to, the, like, the back of the room, because I was just, like, screaming, just, like, shaking. So, somehow like you this. pulled the trigger? Yes. Okay. How many times do you think it went off in your hand? A million times. It went off a bunch in your hand? It, it felt like a million times. Like it, the, even like the first time, it felt like a million you, times. So you, you were pulling the trigger somehow? No, no. Like, it, it's like he has his hand, and my hand was like, I, I, I couldn't even tell you how. Like, it was, it was okay. but it, it was his force that was making, making the, it go off. Yes. Okay. She then said she watched in horror as Chris beat Rachel to death, and according to Christine, he had threatened to do the same thing to her and her family, if she told anyone what had happened that night. You know, I started, I was screaming and like, you know, and just like, you know, I, I kept trying to like, you know, like pull, pull away, but like, but I couldn't cause I felt like just like spaghetti almost. I, I'm trying to remember like how this happened because I remember it was just like, it was so quick. Like I heard like other like shots like going off. From his gun, I guess. I, I, I don't, I don't know what kind. I mean, of there wasn't a third person it, shooting. No, no. Mm -hmm. It, it's just everything was like, it, everything got like, you know, like quiet, like. But you know how, like in the in the movie Saving Private Ryan, you can mm -hmm. hear like shooting, but 
Like, you can't hear, like, anything else. Police were satisfied that she had finally, at least, placed herself at the scene. They were still looking for Chris and visited his last known address, his parents' house. They told his family that there was a warrant out for his arrest. They began a search of the property. In his father's bedroom was a little safe, which contained two guns. Both matched the two types that they were looking for. But by this point, no one had seen Chris in over a week. Detectives looked at his MySpace page and phone records, which led them to Greenville, South Carolina, but Chris had already learned about the manhunt before police could even find him. Testing the guns soon linked them back to the crime scene, but before they could place Chris under arrest, his decomposing body was found in some woods. He had taken an overdose of pills. It is thought that someone had tipped him off about the pending arrest, and he had taken his own life before they could find him. There was now only one person left to talk to, and that was Christine's husband, Justin. He said that Christine had inherited some money after her father passed away, and the couple had bought a small condo with it. Soon after they started living together, a news story about the anniversary of the unsolved murders came out. Christine called Justin in to watch, asking if the billboard picture looked like her. He said Christine broke down and admitted to going to the house to steal money and drugs. She said she was a willing participant, and when Chris started shooting, she didn't hesitate to join in too. Justin also said that Christine had told him that it was her who beat Rachel to death with the gun, not Chris. He said that Christine told him Rachel was crying, asking why over and over, but she didn't stop until she was sure Rachel was dead. Justin said he was completely shocked and scared, but the couple moved out of the condo and went on the run. It later turned out that the anonymous tip that had been made to Crime Stoppers was actually Justin himself. Christine Payalilla was charged with first-degree murder and she entered a plea of not guilty. In a pre-trial hearing, Christine's defence team moved to suppress all three recorded statements. Although she had been advised of her Fifth Amendment rights before each interview, they argued that her statements were technically involuntary because of the medication she had taken and because she was suffering from opioid withdrawal. But this motion was denied and the court later said Christine was lucid and capable of understanding the warnings given to her and the nature of her statements. A couple of years later, the now 22-year-old's trial got underway. The defence advised that Christine did not testify. They showed her confession tapes, reiterating Christine's statement, saying that it was Chris that had killed the group, while she hid. The jurors watched her videotape statement, in which she told police that Chris was responsible for everything, and that she was afraid of him. But the prosecution fired back, saying, over 1,100 calls are made from her to him and him to her. If you are so deathly afraid of someone, what are you doing on the phone with them for over 1,000 phone calls? Dr. George Glass, a psychiatrist testifying for the defence, said that her heroin addiction could not be overlooked. She was in withdrawal at the time she spoke to the police and was saying anything she could to get drugs to relieve the pain. Her lawyer said, she's upset. She totally understands the grief of the families, her friends, the ones who were killed. She only wishes they could understand that she didn't want any of it to happen, but she understands their grief. Rachel's mother disagreed and said, I couldn't take my eyes off her. I really hoped to see something in her eyes in the way of remorse, and it was unbelievable, you know? She never shed a tear unless it was for herself. The prosecution said there was plenty that pointed towards her being involved directly, and the fact that she had started her shift at work just half an hour after the ordeal, instead of phoning the police, showed that she was no victim. Her statements were inconsistent, and she had already admitted to two people, one of which was her husband, that she had actively taken part of her own accord. The prosecution called her denials and blaming everything on Chris a tired and pathetic tactic. Their star witness was actually her husband Justin but the defence argued that Justin's account could not be trusted. 
They said he was focused purely on money, staying with Christine for her inheritance and cashing in on the Crime Stoppers reward by making up a lie. But the jury disagreed. After just three hours of deliberations, Christine Payalilla was found guilty. She was 17 at the time of the murders, which meant she would not face the death penalty. She was, however, sentenced to life in prison, with a minimum term of 40 years to serve. She will be eligible for parole in 2046, when she will be 60 years old. More than five years after the murders back in July 2003, the families of the victims said that they felt the guilty verdict would finally allow them to begin moving on with their lives. Christine has filed many appeals since her conviction, but all of them have been denied. Houston Police Sergeant Brian Harris said that he believes that Christine still does not own her part in the crime. For her to truly come to grips with what she has done, she has to acknowledge that there's a darkness in her soul, he said. Christine's stepfather Thomas said, I'm very sorry for these families and their loss. The guy who did this is dead. He was very, very bad. He was a predator. My daughter is paying for someone else's sins. My daughter doesn't deserve this. My daughter is a victim too. It's hard to know exactly what happened that fateful afternoon and why it did. Police say there were six people at the scene, five of them are now dead and one of them isn't talking. So with this, it is likely that the full truth will never be fully known. The aftermath of that awful day is still widely felt, with Rachel's father calling it an earthquake for the families and community. Marcus's stepfather said, Our lives are very different now. We see things differently than before, and we know that we will never again feel the sense of hope that we used to feel. <laughs>